And if I can just keep these two and stay in League One, like, I think we're going to be okay. Burton, we might have a problem. Hello everyone, welcome back to Burton Abbey in England DNA. Right, so yeah, it's been really good off camera. Almost too good, as we've mentioned before. As you've just seen at the end of the last episode, I talked about us potentially doing too well. Right, so this episode, I wasn't sure exactly what to do, apart from it just being a general like update episode. So what I thought I would do is give you like a deep dive on the stats of what's happened so far in terms of the players, uh, the other teams that are in like the race for the top race for promotion with us, just so that we get a good idea of what statistically we need from the players for this tactic to work in League One. So we all have like reference point, right? So if we have like a youngster that comes in for a few games that attributes wise, we think he's probably not quite ready, but statistically his dribbles per 90, open play, key passes per 90, that kind of stuff is quite close to the first team player. We're like, okay, well, Maybe he's going to develop into that player. If he can perform at the same, you know, statistical level as the first team player, then maybe he will be good enough. Who knows? So I think I'm going to start to use a bit of that. And it's going to be a little bit of a, not intro, because most of you that would have seen my content before would have watched my previous Moneyball save. But I'm going to be doing a new Moneyball save quite soon in the new year. That's going to be coming up quite soon. It's going to be a bit of, a bit like of a, I wouldn't say intro or even a segue, but it's just like I'm using some concepts that I'll probably be using for that into this. And we'll use Data Hub a little more this year, I think, as well. And showcasing a lot of the new stats. There are so many new stats in FM this year that I think that if you haven't really looked, you wouldn't have noticed. But there are so many brilliant new stats in the game that can really help you out. Uh, things like expected assists, things like non-penalty XG, things like open play key passes per 90, opposition passes per defensive action. Those kind of things right, are all good pitch tilt. That's also another, another good one. So I thought I'd start off with the, the player stats and try to look at what is it from our players statistically that's making them perform and be, and be top of the league with Burton Albion. Obviously, the tactic is going to play a major part and be why certain uh, stats are going to be higher for some of our players compared to the other, the, the other teams. But I still just want to look at, you know, what, what does a player that gets you top of the league look like? So I just want to have a look at some of the players here. I've got a couple of views. So this one originally was... One sent to me by FM Stag, who if you do want any sort of like custom views with your stats or anything like that, he's definitely the person to go to. It's brilliant. We spoke before about this being Stag. Uh, I have a slight difference of how I like to structure my view. And again, this episode is being recorded on my laptop for the final time. This will definitely be the final one. I just didn't want to leave it another two days without sending you another video. So uh, the reason why I say that is you can see here how I can only see so much. And it's to do with my resolution and stuff, right? And the size of my... Uh, my monitor screen, when I change that for the next episode, I should be able to see like not just all of this, but I can fit loads more onto the screen. And that's sort of the reason why I didn't want to look at stats really early on was because I wanted to make sure I had my big monitor. But yeah, this is my sort of like generic one. It doesn't really give you loads of information, but it gives you the, the keys, right? It gives you your goals, assists, open play key passes per 90, I think it's really important, progressive passes per 90, non-penalty XG per 90, crosses completed per 90, dribbles per 90. I think in possession, that's like the, the crux of a lot of the stuff. There's more you could add, but that's the crux of a lot of it. Uh, then tackle one ratio, header one ratio, precious complete distance covered per 90 is there as well. So again, it's not it's not everything, but it's enough of the basics to give you like a generic overview of a player. So we're just going to look at this first. So as you can see here, we've actually got our starting 11 in the team. Now I'm just going to move them around so that the players are close to each other. And I want to look at all the centre-backs together. So I'm going to take out Ben Garrett from the goalkeeper position and put him there. Maybe I'll take out him and put him in there. So now, as you can see there, the top five are all my centre-backs, pretty much the, all the players that mainly play centre-back anyway. So let's have a look at them defensively here. Let's have a quick look. So you're looking at Corey, uh, Nadaba, upwards here. So we're going to have all of these five here we're looking at sort of upwards. So you've got Taka 1 ratio. Now, Brayford is quite low on that compared to the rest, which is which is interesting. Header 1 ratio, though, he's at 90%. He's only like 5 for 8, but he's winning his headers a lot. Which is, uh, which is quite impressive, really. In fact, do you know what? Let's just get a defensive view out. So now this is like all my defensive stats that I like to have. Uh, this this isn't like a finalized one, although it says Moneyball there. It's something I just put together like on day one of the game. I just quickly put together to put as many defensive stats in as I could. Let's actually look at this bit more detail here. So tackle one ratio is low, but headers one high. Tackles per 90. Sam Hughes is quite low on that. His interceptions is the is the leads. Do I have mistakes on this? No, that's interesting. Maybe we should add mistakes. I don't... Sam Hughes would be quite high on that. 
This actions per height per ninety though goes to Brayford again. He's playing quite hard, Brayford, isn't he? Dab is quite low on that, but he's played wing back a little bit. Blocks per ninety. Sam Hughes at the bottom doesn't surprise me. Uh, Precious attempted per ninety. That isn't as big of a deal to me. Key tackles per ninety. Tom Hamer's had a few, but he has played wing back at the start of the season for the first couple of games or so. So there is that. So looking at that, there isn't there isn't too much that stands out. But the Tom Hamer's head on ratio and tackle ratio is slightly lower. But he did play wing back, didn't he? for a few games that's going to distort his, his stats a little bit, especially with only 11 games played and two or three of them being at wing back. So th there is that, of course. So let's take this view and let's apply this custom view to one of our tight arrivals and let's see what they're doing and why we are above them, at least with our defenders and centre-backs. So here is Peterborough. Now let's look at their centre-backs. Head on ratio. So they're only playing a back two, obviously, or, or two centre-backs. Playing a back four with two centre-backs. And uh, Taka one ratio, Frankie Kent here, who I had on my money ball save, actually, didn't I, with uh, with Barnsley. 50% Taka ratio, that's really poor. Uh, head one ratio, 78 by Ronnie Edwards isn't great, but we play a back three, and one of our back three's got that, but the other two don't. Uh, interceptions per 90, that's both lower than our centre-backs, isn't it? I'm pretty sure five is below all of ours. Yeah, interesting, key tackles per 90 is not that far off. I don't know, is there too much to learn from that? They do seem to be performing worse. Let's try somebody else. Tackle one ratio, 45%. What is he doing? Just diving in. And then you've got tackle, tackles one per 90, or tackles per 90, 0 0.61. That's really poor from him. And his average rating's high. Um, he gets a lot of interceptions, though, see? So you can be a little low on something if you're overcompensating for it in a different area. You see, I suppose that's how he's getting away with it there. And that works for him. So there you go. Here we go. Barnsley have got a lot of, uh, a lot of positive feelings towards Barnsley. And they're playing back three as well, incidentally. So let's have a look. Almost the same tactic as us, which is interesting. Okay, this would be a really interesting one then, because they're playing almost the same tactic as us. The same same formation, anyway. Let's have a look. Back three then. Headers one ratio, 84, 93, 89. Um, so I don't know. I suppose overall their back three looks slightly better in the air. Tackle completion ratio, 77, 182. 100% in five matches. I've seen 100 before, but like when they've played like one match or they come off the bench once sort of thing. That's pretty impressive. So let's see then. I could calculate all this. The kind of thing I'll do here in the Moneyball Save is calculate the average between the, th the three and see uh, and see where we're at. But yeah, they look slightly better there as well. Interceptions per 90, they've got four and eight and a six. We've got a six, six, seven. Again, it's slightly better on that. Uh, I, like They look better overall wing, but uh, they look like they're playing better overall at centre-back, which is interesting. But I'm pretty sure we're the highest scorers in the league. So they've scored 18, we've scored 29. I was already considered 12, so... Okay, I'm going to look at wing-backs. Now, the slight problem with this is I've only really used two players wing-back all the time. Oh, Carroll's actually played as a striker as well, but Carroll and Smith both played as wing-backs, but Hamer's played some there, Cam was played some there, Nadal's played some there, and so was a couple of other players. It was hard to actually judge the wing-backs according to the other, the other team, so I'm not really going to look at that for this one because it's going to be too different. But what's interesting is if you look at the wing-backs, dribbles per 90. Tom Hamer's got pretty big dribbles per 90, which I'm really interested in because, you know... Players are improving, by the way. I know this isn't for this episode, it'll be for the next one, but it has made an impact, I think, having such good facilities and having a program that's that seems to be to be working a little bit. Hamer's currently on a ball playing defender defend, and he's doing all right there. But crucially, he's doing well in the category that he's working on. So agility and balance is what he's working on. And there you go, you're getting some returns out of it. Not quite yet, but hopefully soon. Okay, I've just had to put a cross commission into this view here. So currently, Carriol's on 11 and Johnny Smith's on 17. Now, I just want to go off of that compared to the other team that plays three at the back against us. So what is theirs? So theirs is currently 15% and 8%. That's what they've got. So 15 and 8, and we've got 11 and 17. So we're definitely above on that. That's interesting. And dribbles per 90, let's just judge that as well. Something I'm always interested in. 1.67, 3.20. And theirs is higher on that, though. Interesting. Okay. Sprints per 90, 17, 15. Sprints per 90, 12 and 19. Look at that. Interesting. Okay. And Bobby Camwood, to be fair, he's only played wing back, so he could be included in this. Let's make him go number three. So he could be included in that. He's just not as good, but he does play wing back as well. The training was already trending back up, but everybody feels like they're improving now. And the reason I think for that is that winning matches as well. That's making definitely an impact on having good match ratings, morale being high playing well in matches, winning matches, all that stuff, I think is having a bit of an impact as well. So I don't want to put this all down to the schedule because I don't know if the schedule would be getting this out of the players if we were losing. Right, top four again. Let's look at the pivot players. So defensive first, let's look at this then. Let's look at... I've tried to put them in order of like who starts. 
Head-on ratio, Kieran Gilligan, 30%. That is a disgrace to the sport, Kieran. Um, he's 5'6", five, 5 jump and reach, so I suppose that does actually... does compute. He doesn't really start matches. He comes on off the bench to be like a box-to-boxer, and he's really good at doing it, actually. So I'm actually quite happy with him when he does that. But so, yeah, it's not great, is it, in the air? In the air, generally, we're pretty average to poor. Tackle one ratio is pretty similar across the board. That's interesting. Tackles per 90. Kieran's got the most. He initiates the contact earlier, which is okay. Interceptions per 90 goes to Kieran as well. So Kieran makes up for his lack of aerial ability in having a similar tackle ratio, but much higher than these two. Blocks per 90 goes to Terry Taylor. Good. Pressures attempted per 90. That should definitely go to the box to box. Yeah, the reason why those two are higher is just because on the right-hand side, obviously, of the tactic, there's nobody in front of them, so they have to go and engage more than the left side. So the thought process is that that right box-to-boxer would have, you know, a little more acceleration and be a slightly more mobile player, right? Let's see, does distance covered per 90 compute with that? A little bit. Like, you can see the two box-to-boxers, which is 8.7, 8.9, and then 8.5, 8.3 for the two CDMs. But it's not it's not too different, is it? Interesting. Let's move on to the uh, attacking with all players. Probably should have done this earlier, to be honest, and highlighted it. <laughs> um to make it easy to see who we're looking at. I think it was obvious enough, but there we are. So the attacking field players then, just looking really at the in-possession aspect of them, don't really care about the defensive. So goals goes to Powell. Obviously, this is only really for one position. It's like Powell's the first choice, Lacken's the second, and Terry Taylor's the third choice, and Elliot thought would be the absolute emergency there. And it's just per 90 is interesting. That's pretty close between the two. Goals per 90 is by far to Powell, but he's obviously... Uh, well, I don't know, like, Lacken's not played pivot that often. So they both played in the 10 position about the same. Passes complete per 90 is pretty close. That's much higher for Terry Taylor because he plays in the pivot role, of course. Dribbles per 90, Joe Powell 2.02. That's really impressive. Really him and Lacking are the two that only really play as a 10. So there's quite a big difference, I would say, between those two players. He, Powell is way more effective at creating goals and scoring goals. As you can see by the XG per 90 and expected assist per 90. Uh, Dribbles per 90, cross completion, sprint per 90. Distance covers the same, open by key passes per 90. By every metric possible, Powell is a much better player than Lacking. But let's see how good they are in relation to another team. Okay, looking through their fixtures, they seem to use two players, they're 10 in their like same tactic as us. It's either Sean McGurk or they've got Jack Aitchinson. So goals per night is much lower. XG per night is very low. Expect this is even lower. Pass completions, whatever. Passes complete per night, we don't really care about that. Dribbles per 90 is quite low compared to our players. 0% cross completion. See, that's where, like, if my tactic had my number 10 in the middle, how many crosses would he do? Probably not that many, but in that sort of offset left or there are times where he gets in that half space, takes a touch, and then whips it across the face of goal, and you just wouldn't get that chance getting created in the match engine anywhere near as much if he was dead in the centre like theirs is. So there's a good difference between the two teams there just by having, if they offset their 10 the way that we do, I bet they'd be slightly better going forwards, and these lads would be getting crosses in the box. Uh, sprints per 90 is whatever. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, they look significantly worse than our players. Like, I think that as long as we have power fit, there's no way Barnsley should finish above us because I think that that, for, for, for that being such a crucial part of your team, I think the number 10 role there, for both of us, the gap between those players is absolutely monumental in the output they're giving right now. That may not continue, of course. They may get better, we may get worse, and we may lose power, etc. But right now, like, there's not even a comparison. Like, I think that they could be doing better in lots of other areas and we'd still finish above them because I think that's such an important position to where they're losing lots of their attacks. I mean, I'm surprised they're doing that well, really. They must be quite a direct team. And yet, well, as you can see, look, if you look at the average possession, Barnes are next to us. So we're 14th but, and we're quite a direct team and they're only 12th. So that, that does compute with what I, what I thought. Pass completion of 80%, yeah. There you go, 73 for us. Oh dear. Okay, then strikers, only going to look at in possession, of course. So you have got goal scored, Victor's over 13, Winnell's got 7, Kellerdon's got 9, which is, it's not Keller, is it? It's Kilo Davis, mate. Sorry for mispronouncing your name there. <laughs> Elliot Thorpe there's got 1 as well. Then assists is whatever, it's pretty low for all across the board. Goals per 90, so you have got Victor with 1.31, Winnell with 0.95, then Dunn's got 1.07. That's really impressive. Goals per 90 across the board, really, really good stuff. XG per 90, 0.57, 1.13. So Winnell's getting into a lot of areas, not scoring as often as the other lads, but at least he's doing something. He's stretching the team, he's getting in behind, he's creating chances, which is which is still good. Dribbles per 90, Dunn's got quite high, but he has played wing back a few games as well and off the bench a few times, he's gone on and done that. Cross completion is, isn't really a huge issue. Sprints per 90, Winnell's got the most, which is interesting because he's only played striker and Dunn's played wing back. 
and distance covered per 90 is is fine. Open play key passes. Victor's had a few of those. Nice. Okay. So looking at that, Victor is clearly a top, top level League One player and probably a championship level player. Looking at him, I don't, maybe, like, his attributes, I'm not sure. But the style of play that we have suits him ideally well. And this is what I'm saying about going in the future and talking about tweaking the tactic and stuff and the, well, the formation at least, because if that was like a, a new gen player for us through our academy, I'd be looking at this like, like if we, now we know that's all we need is somebody just this good for them to be effective in League One. If we can create the tactic around them, if they're a striker, of course. So if I was to change formation of this, I'm going to keep my philosophy the same. Now, when I say I keep the philosophy the same, it doesn't mean I'm going to keep those, those settings exactly as they are. Because if I was to change to a 4-3-3, playing this direct in a different system may make the players go further forwards a little quicker than they do here. The reason it's so direct here with attacking mentality is because there's a back three and four players in front of them, there's a tendency for them to build a little too long. So to almost create the same patterns, I probably, if I change system, would have to probably knock this down a little bit. I'd probably take the timber down one and the directness down one, maybe even two, depending on the system. So yeah, the idea is exactly the same as I, as I sort of talked about in episode one, but that it may look a little different in the team settings, even though the philosophy, from my perspective, is exactly the same. So I just thought I'd make that, that sort of point there, but... And let's just compare those to the strikers in and around us. We'll go back to the clubs now as well, because we're only going to look at their striker here. So, I mean, this guy here, I'd say their striker is almost on a bit power with Victor, but like expected goals per 90 is quite low. So what I'm thinking here is he's got a lot of goals early on and he's going to start to decline in his goals later in the season. Old uh, Clark Harris here. That's my expectation is he's scoring a lot of low XG goals and that will slow up. That's my prediction right now. It, he may not. Players always have those seasons where they just keep scoring that entire season. And then for the next two or three, they go back to where they were. And you're like, what happened? And people look to blame the tactics of the manager. Sometimes that player is just having like a really good spell where, the, where they just happen to score all their, uh, all their low extra chances in, in one period. So the team, so they were Kobe on, on loan, who is pretty good. He's an effective player. Only scored four goals, but only five starts. They must have somebody else to play up front as well. I mean, it's not that impressive, is it? Like, I think my strikers are doing better than all of those there. And lastly, Barnes, you're playing a two-man strike force, which is maybe slightly better to reference against. And looking at that, I mean, that's not even close, is it? Our strikers, I mean, oh, James Norwood's there as well, of course, who's a really good player. I still think that our strikers are massively outperforming their strikers there. And it, it depends whether it continues. If it continues, we've obviously got a massive advantage because our strikers are much uh, overperforming compared to that. But well, not over overperforming, because that indicates that they're performing above themselves. They may stay at that level the whole season for our players. We don't know yet. I fully anticipate a drop in form at some point, but I do keep saying that and it doesn't happen. So, okay, let's take a look at some team stats rather than just the individual stats and let's see where we're at with some of these. So average possession, where are we? We are 14 with 46%. And as you can see, Peter and Barnes are actually quite close to us. So the first, second and fourth place teams are in this area here. Anybody below us is generally doing pretty bad, except for Cambridge with fifth with 41%. That's pretty impressive, to be fair. Goals per game and goals is definitely for us. Expected goals over performance. That's interesting. So we're not actually that high on this. So we're getting the goals that we should be. So although we've scored a lot, it's because we're creating a lot. It's not that we've gotten lucky. We've got a few penalties, which, I mean, that does happen. So expected goals under performance. So yeah, we're about what we should be. But there's a lot of teams that are not performing very well at all on their, uh, on their expected goals. So our non-penalty expected goals is 22.66. The next nearest team is 17.27. That's, that's quite far, isn't it? That's, that's quite a big gap between the two. Non-penalty XG per 90 is 1.89. So we're getting a 1.89 XG every match at the moment without a penalty. And obviously, if you get penalty, it's higher than that. Penalties taken about eight, which is double the amount of the next nearest teams. Not really sure why that is, but it's, we're quite direct and we're putting it into the box a lot. And maybe it's, that's what it is. Cross completion, we're the, we are the highest on that, which is uh, which is good. We put the most crosses in. So put the most crosses in, and we're the most accurate from them, which is interesting. We've scored one goal from a corner. That's it so far. So it's not a corner or set piece specific tactic that makes it work. Pass completion ratio, we're a disgrace. We are 20th. Pass is completed with 21st. No, we're near the top. Chances created, though, we have got 63, which is just crazy. 63 chances created. Next to team has 41. Shot and target ratio, we are third. Conversion rate, we are first. That's I've never had that before. So that means our strikers are actually taking the chances. There you go. Who'd have thought it? That was definitely not the case in the first match or two, was it? Final third pass is a pitch tilt. We are only 12th on that, which is quite interesting. So almost buying in on that. That's, that's pretty good. Because what that shows 
is it shows that we've got quite a very passing style, right? So it shows at times we can pin teams back and be probing and retain the ball, stay on the ball, go back to a bit of the Ying DNA, which I don't know if it sh- I showed it in the slides, but one of the big things is staying on the ball when you can. But also that if we need to go and play a quick one in behind it, if the gap is there, why not Why not take it? Um, and we, we try to engage when we can. So we try to stop the opposition from having too many, but it's game situation, all right? So goals conceded, we are doing okay for that. Expected goals against... We are the eighth best team for that. Goals conceded from corners. We're on zero, which is good. Clean sheets, we've had four. Tackle one ratio. We are 13th. Bang the table for that. That's something I was interested to see there. Interceptions, where are we at for this? Fifth, okay. Possessions one. We are third. That's really good. Okay, so opposition passes per defensive action. We are currently the best team for that. So that goes back to a bit of the DNA, which is talking about trying to engage at the highest point, but factoring in all the other variables within football, like result, match situation. So for every defensive action that we perform, which is things like tackling, the opposition get 3.42 passes between them, which is the best in the league, which means we are getting pressure and we are applying defensive actions towards the opposition before they can retain too many passes, which is a little bit down to the structure of the formation with having wing backs that can go and press high, especially higher now in FM23 compared to FM22. And with a 10 and two strikers, it sort of spreads itself out, right? And if they do play into that sort of gap that we've got, which is where the right CDM is, that's where he then steps up and engages really aggressively. So it, we get pressure anywhere we can. And final third passes against him. We don't really give up that many. So we don't, we're mid table for final third passes four, but we're one of the best against. So overall, we're in the, we're in the positive. You know, if you look at that as a negative and positive common overall, column overall. Um, yeah, there you go. Finances are looking pretty good. Our projections to finish with, well, not in the red, so it's always a positive. So a lot of this that we've got, I've moved it around a little bit for uh, for it to be in some sort of order, but a lot of this is going to tell us the same stuff we've just looked at. But one thing I want to look at was was this. It just says it to you in a, like an easier way here. So XG tables, our expected goals is 28. According to this, expected goals against is 3.31. So we're actually one better off there. And expected points, we've got three more points than we should have gotten so far according to their calculations. That's, that's pretty good. That means we're pulling pretty well, I would say. And to back that up, here's another little stat for you. This is why they have so good, right? Because now we can back that by looking at the uh, the shooting one here. So if you look at this graph here, we've got aggressive shooting, clinical shooting. So this is where you want to be really is in this one. So you're getting a lot of shots and you're being clinical. And that's what we are. So like here's like you're not getting many shots, but you're clinical when you take them. So that's Derby over here. And then this is the worst one. You don't want to be bottom left here because that would be mean you're not getting many shots and you're wasteful at them anyway. So... There you are. So we are by far the best team in the league and there's not anybody really close to us either, which is which is good. So this is the pass map from our last game against Forest Green. So what it's showing us here is we actually do build up our attacks on the left-hand side a little more, which is where we go across the left-centre back, left-centre back into the left wing back, or at least we did in this game. And then that went into like the number 10. Not really many passes into the striker there, which is interesting, but a lot of right-centre back to left CDM when the pivot's pushed forward to the right pivots pushed forward so that's it that's interesting there it's an interesting little graph to show us which uh yeah be nice to see that over a longer period and keep track of that a little more and just one final graph here i looked through a few of these wasn't really sure which ones i wanted to show you because there's, i could show you all of them because they all have impact on what we've just spoke about a second ago we'll finish on the crossing as you can see here with this one lots of cross and accurate crossing so you want to be top right of this ideally even if you're not a crossing team um, you want to be on the right side because it's accurate here. So like you might, you want to be somewhere on the right hand side of this because this is inaccurate crossing on this side. So you want to be this side. And if you're a team that plays wing backs in FM, you're probably going to be crossing slightly more. So for us, that's really good. We're the highest, we're the most accurate crossing team with the most crosses. So there you go. The graphs all match up, which is which is nice. Right then, so today's actual episode in terms of matches, we're going to play Peterborough and Morecambe. So we're going to play currently the team that's second in the league because we're top, but they were first. And Morecambe, who are 21st. Now, I've been tempted, not going to lie to you, I've been slightly tempted to start rotating some players and play some of the youngsters. I mean, I mean, I mean youngsters, but like, Nadaba's not going to be here next year, right? And we're top of the league, and getting promoted is as much of a blessing as it is a curse. So why not play the players that are going to be here next year anyway? One, to improve them, and you know, two, to keep them happier. So I, I've decided to sort of like, start to get on that road a little bit. I, like, I'm not trying to throw the games, I'm just going to try and be more uh, pragmatic about the player development aspect to this. So Nadab is going to probably going to get dropped from the starting 11 at this point. And we're going to start to play like um, Oshilaja, probably get some minutes. And Carroll is going to come out of the team as well. Probably play Kamwa. I want to try and get somebody else wing back because I don't think he's really good enough, especially not for the championship. And I don't really know if there's anybody else. Maybe Dunn could do it, but I need him for the striker role really. So 
Yeah, maybe maybe I do play him though, because then at least it would leave me Elliot Thorpe from the bench. And although I know he's not going to be here next year, it would only be to like come off the bench, do bits and pieces roles. I think for this one, I'm going to play Keller Dunn at wing back. Maybe play Camwood there then in the next one. We'll try that. Well, that'll be our team. Terry Taylor's a bit tired, but apart from that, that's going to be a team there. Hopefully we can get on and do all right in this game. It'll be interesting to see. And again, who knows what's going to happen? We could end up going up here and, oh, I don't know what's going to happen with that. I'll, let's get into the game. Let's see what happens. Assistant manager says, media comments. They are going to play a 4-3-3 single pivot. Interesting. To be fair, we did know that because I just looked at their squad. I mean, if we were to win this game, we're going to get promoted, aren't we? Because this is the hardest game we've got all season. It's Peterborough away, who are by far the best side early in the season. And if we can drop points away to them now, um, yeah, there we go. There's a chance. Oh, it's, oh, Christ. He's misjudged it, Pocky. What are you doing? Hamer's got it. He's going to travel with it. Keller Dunn's now got it. He's going to whack it into the back post. Win or scores. 1-0 to Burton Albion. And I don't know what I think about this. It's 1-0 to Burton, though. Again, accurate crossing. We're an accurate crossing team. We looked at the stats. Hamer plays a great ball into Keller Dunn, who's playing out of position completely. He doesn't even play me back at all, according to his tactics page. And hits 1-0 to Burton. And win all again. So if we look at win all's tactical, or player profile rather, he's not amazing in the air. 11 jump and reach. And so that means when the ball's coming long from a goal kick, he's probably not going to beat the centre back in the air, but he's good enough at accurate heading. And he's got good enough movement anticipations 14 to get on the end of crosses right. So... He can do the business in League One. Can he do the business in the Championship? I'm going to guess it's a no, but I think we're going to find out the answer to that because I think we're going up. Highlight up for the highlight up for half time here. Taylor's got it. Plays to Oshilaja, who takes a few touches, whacks it into Big Victor, and it's been cleared away. Smith gets it. Smith's going to take a terrible touch, gives it away. We're going to initiate a counter press here. No, we're not. We're going to just let them play it, but we get it back anyway. Winnell, if he's not offside, that's a unbelievable decision from the referee and Victor then he scores a header it's going to be cleared away and that's going to probably be half time it is half time we'll say things are going well but I know you're it is half time we'll say things are going well but I know you're capable of even better and we'll keep it the same I think early on Taylor's going to be the first player to come off now normally I probably wouldn't take him off here but I also want to stress that's the team and take out as many of our key players as we can and see if they can still beat Peter Bro away let's put uh Right, let's do this. Keller Dunn goes up front. Let's put Cam at wing back. And let's take off Sam Hughes and put on Borthwick Jackson. See how the boys get on here. Poku dribbles inside. Keller Dunn with a big challenge. They're going to continue on though with Fuchs, Taylor. Poku might have been offside. He wasn't. We clear it away. Oh, here. Garrett plays it out to Borthwick Jackson. Travels with it, travels with it, whacks it into Thorpe. That's no, no good at all, but are we going to get to this now? Camwa gets to it. Bobby Camwa. He plays it into Thorpe, who's through. It's a penalty referee. It's another penalty. It's the ninth penalty of the season. And Burton Albion have got a chance to go 2-0 up away to Peterborough. And this would probably, I don't know, I, I wouldn't guess that we're going to drop this position. It's 2-0. I don't believe it. It's 2-0. Wow. Throw in here for Peterborough. They play inside to Edwards, to Taylor. They go back to the goalkeeper, wax it long. Right, so my thinking now is become, could we just somehow survive one season in the championship? Because all you'd need is survive the first one, and you'd probably be all right after that. Your club rep would go up a little bit, your players would improve, we'd probably hopefully get some better players in, that's three. I mean, we're going up. I, I, I've got to be accepting the fact we're going to go up, because if we've just beaten Peterborough 3-0 away from home, I know we're in good form, but we had a couple of players missing. I took some players out of the team early on, and we're just too good for the standard of football, I think. Maybe uh, I think the tactic is pretty good. Could I deliberately change a tactic to make us play something else and try something new? I could. It's not realistic, though. It's not something you would do, is it, in this situation? There's no way you would do that. Unless there's a big tactical flaw. But we've looked at the stats. We know, looking at the stats, that whatever the tactic looks like it has issues on paper, statistically, and in terms of results, it's performing very, very, very well. And the best of anybody in the league. So it's... It's really hard to, to make a case for even doing something like that. This heart is going to continue. They're going to go long in behind. Are they going to get a chance? Nope, lacking in Shaughnessy. Shaughnessy walks out to Smith, who's 1v1. That's what we want. 1v1 from our wingbacks, because that's why they're basically wingers. And he's lost the ball. And, wow. Rather you than me is the expression we're looking for. Headed away. Smith's going to get to it. Yeah, my thought process already goes to next year. And that's why 
more important than ever, I have to basically stop using all the loan players because they're not going to be with us next year. So the actual players we do have are going to be with us next year in the championship. My concern is the youth players we get through could come into League One and do a job for us, especially in a team that's going to be doing pretty well. Could they come into a championship team, which one is obviously a higher level, but two in a team that doesn't win all the time? Obviously, we won't know until we see them, but my gut feeling is the answer we know to that question anyway. We'll see what well done, lads. That was good for us. We'll try and play it down. But that was actually a really impressive win. Not just to win, to win the game 1 or 2 nil would have been amazing, but to win it 4? Unreal. Okay, I'll see you in a few days for the Morgan game. Before we do, I've just got to show you this profile. I don't think I've ever seen a player 34 years or older who has started to trend down during a season to then get something like this on their training profile. I don't think I've ever seen it. So whatever we're doing right now is definitely working for John Brayford. So John Brayford, he doesn't have anything selected here. He does have an additional focus and that's working well for him. It's exactly the same for Keller Dunn, who's been improving with nothing being selected. But then Hamer has got something selected and is doing well specifically in the areas that we're to there. So at the moment, it's really hard to tell with this current group of players, with this team, with these facilities, which is the better one to go for? Joe Powell's not got anything selected. He's not really improving, but he's playing well. I'm probably going to change Joe's one to um, probably Shadow Striker. That's probably the uh, best one to put him on. So I'll put him on that and see if we can change him a little bit. But uh, yeah, incredible stuff. And right, I'll see you in a few days then for the walking game now. Okay, welcome back. Slightly different team for this game. I think we're going to go with going to Garrett and Gold Hamer. Uh, Oshilaja and Brayford across the back with Kamwa, Gilligan, Taylor, Smith across there, and then Powell, Winnell, and Victor up front. I'm going to play Kamwa and Gilligan because Gilligan could be a pretty good player next year in the championship, but he needs to have game time and he's not going to get it with the current team we're playing. So he's going to have to get rotated in. We have to do a rotation system really where I basically just take two players in, two players out the whole time. Like players like Sean Seed Lackin, Borthwick, Jackson, Keller, Dunn, they need to get minutes and I just need to be rotating and regardless of who we play because now we've beaten Peterborough away doing basically that it shouldn't matter who we're playing against the team should be able to still do pretty well and are we undefeated still no we lost the first game didn't we and we lost another one okay but you know we're currently five points clear of the the automatic places or the playoffs here and we're 10 points clear of the playoffs of falling outside the playoffs so it's almost guaranteed already in fm terms that we're going to be in the playoffs this year and Let's just see what happens. Let's get into this game against Morecambe. Rotate a few players. So we get on. System manager says, if you carry on your performance from the last match, you'll do well. Okay. I love our identity at this football club. What are we going to play against? We're going to play against a four, almost same formation. Interesting. Okay. Early highlight for Morecambe, by the looks of it. Wow. They're going to start off with the ball. Let's see what happens. They go direct. They're going behind. They're in. And they score. One nil Morecambe. Highlight for Morecambe out from the back. They go long, directing behind. Oshilaja wins the header. Gilligan has it. Plays it to Terry Taylor. Stays on the ball. Gives it back to the keeper. Split back three. Thank you. Brayford plays it into Smith. Smith takes a touch. Takes a touch. Plays back to Brayford again. They can link on the left-hand side. Brayford does like to do this. We saw this in the last pass map we looked at. Brayford loves to play it in here to the wing back. He's going to spread the play across. I love that. That's some really good switching of the play. Don't see that that often in football manager. Camber, please score from this. Oh, it's brilliant. That is an absolutely brilliant goal from Burton Albion. So we're playing on attacking mentality. We're playing on higher tempo. We're playing more direct. But it's because of the, of the formation. You can see how even with all those settings, because of the way the players are positioned, they're going to have to still be careful about who they play it to. And that's why it's slightly more direct because you can still get... It's still a tactic that can build from the back. You know, it doesn't mean they're just going to do that all the time. It still They still can build from the back. We're still a... I'd call us a mixed passing team. We're not really a ball retaining team or a direct team. I'd say we're still quite mixed. And the reason the settings are like it is because of the way that the formation is set up and the way that the players will make their decisions. So, yeah, that was beautiful. I love that. And you don't see that that often in FM like that. Um, that was a really good switch of play in the build-up phase of the, uh, the attack as, wow, Cole Stockton is just on one today. 2-1 Morecambe. Okay, Morecambe up the ball. They've lost it. Smith gets it, plays it up a bit direct. And they're going to come back. As Cole Stockton in for a hat-trick. Is he going to score? Oh, he nearly did as well. It's not good, is it? This is more realistic for us, I think, though. Are they going to score still? Oh, they nearly did. But you can see, like, the second strike was incredible from them. Their XG is 0 0.25 and they scored two goals, so it's like, you know. Kama throws into Oshilaja, plays it across to Powell. Victor, Victor goes through, scores 2-2. Okay, we'll see if we can win this if we keep working hard, which they hopefully should be. Instant highlight in today, then. Smith gets it, plays it back to Brayford, who's going to play it probably back to him. Uh, well, he shouldn't, but it's just what my guess would be from looking at the pass that he had in the last uh, the last time. 
Uh, they're going behind Braveheart's going to collect this. Braveheart's going to apply it to Hamer. Hamer is a really good player. I love Hamer. What a brilliant right side of the back three that he is. That is terrible from Camwell. That's what I sort of expect there from him. As they're only getting behind, Hamer's going to recover this again. Braveheart gets it. Is he going to look for left striker for once, or is he going to left wing back again? Oh, he's going to actually lose it. Don't play it to Cole Stockton again because he'll fucking score. Taylor, Braveheart, Hamer. I like this little Braveheart to Hamer pass that we're getting. Victor's in. Play across goal. Oh, he's just gone for it. 3 2. We're ahead again. Instant highlight again. A lot of highlights in this game. As more can play out from the back. They're going to play it in behind. We're going to get to that though. Oshelaja has that easy. Kamwa. Now Hamer. Oshelaja. Travels with it. Travels with it. Travels with it some more. And then plays it into Kamwa. I don't think he was intending for that, was he? Didn't like he was. Oshelaja, a little overlap. Middle. I love this. That's the creativity one in our England DNA. I absolutely love that. Freedom of expression. Go on, lads. Go get yourselves involved. That is an ambitious effort though, Gilligan. Let's be honest about it. Going to take off Hamer and put on Borthwick Jackson at left centre back and move Braveheart out to the right. As there was a highlight trigger right before I did that. So this is actual an actual highlight. This isn't just like an after the sub sort of thing. Gilligan whacks it into their centre mid who stood right there. Well done, Gilligan. Um, Clark's in. 3-3. Three, three. What a game. Highlight here. Powell, the free kick. Works, whacks it to the far post. Braveheart gets head on it. Keeper collects it. Before the next bit of this highlight happens, I just want to make some changes here. We've got one stoppage left. We can make another three. Let's take off Winnell and put on Elliot Thorpe up front. Let's put Keller Dunn at wing back. And I guess Shaughnessy for Oshelaja. There you go. If we scored this, I think we've won the game. So there's a pretty, actually pretty good substance out the game as well. He's going to go long because I think Oshelaja has actually been part of the problem. Middle centre back has been terrible. What a foot in from the goalkeeper. This goal is 4-3 to Morecambe. Yeah, he's been awful at middle centre-back, by the way. They throw it short. I think we've got a chance we can win it here. Thought what gets it. Gilligan, who's been playing absolute shite as well, plays it. Who, who, who was that to? Who was that to, Gilligan? Shaughnessy's is going to get this easy. I don't know what that is. With rugby kick, is it? Um, we're going to regain this or are we not? Are they going to get another highlight from this? They might do. Nah, we'll get to that. Brayford, Shaughnessy. Back into Brayford. Braveheart travels with it to Gilligan. Gilligan to Keller Dunn, who's got time. Plays an awful ball into Thorpe. There's some rugby kicks going on here from our boys. Not sure they know what spot they're playing. Can we get the ball back at some point from this? Nope. Carl Stockton's through. If he shoots, it's a goal. 5-3 to Morecambe. Right, we'll go for the 4-2-4 four, four to try and get back into the game. I don't know if we're going to get back into this. Like We just seem to not be able to, to get going in this one now. But right, that's the 4-2-4 four, four team. Let's see if that works. If we get one before the 82nd minute, I think we've got a chance of making it 5-5. Five, five. Okay, it's a corner. It's going to be a corner. Smith whacks it in. Sean O'Sea, there it is, 5-4. Can we get another one? Come on, let's make it 5-5. Five, five. Here we go. Highlight here. Sean O'Sea whacks out to Gilligan. Get off the ball. You've been useless all game. Adebayo has it. Victor. Victor's got options. Don't shoot. Don't shoot from miles out. Now, now you can. Now you can. Oh, no. He got so close to the goal and he still missed it. I don't believe it. Another highlight. Brayford's got it. Plays into Smith. Smith plays it in behind the victor. He's in. Is he going to score? Is he going to score? It's 5-5. Five, five. It's 5-5. Five, five. Burton Allen have come all the way back. It's unbelievable scenes. It's a hat-trick for Victor. What a team this is. I can't believe what I'm seeing. 5-5. Five, five. Unreal. I said, didn't I? I just had a feeling if we got one, we could, we could get another. We're just that kind of team in League One. Victor, unbelievable stuff. I've just gone back to like our normal system, but with the 10 in the middle on balance mentality, just to sort of see out the game. And I still think we can have, we can have a chance to score a winner, but we won't, I don't think we'll concede another one. Oh, we need to score it there as well. There's a last minute highlight. Who's it going to be for? Thorpe, Victor. Victor to Borthwick Jackson, his left foot, don't forget. Is he going to cut back and cross this? There it is. There's the cut back. Oh, he's dribbled past him. Oh, he doesn't know what to do with him. He doesn't know what to do with it. Lacking, he's left footed. Keller Dunn. What are we doing with this, lads? 30 seconds. Oh, we're giving it away. Oh, don't lose the, don't lose the game. I don't believe what they've just done. What sort of defending was that? Oh my goodness, they've missed it. 5-5. Five, five. What a game of football. Round of applause for both teams. What a brilliant game of football that was. 5-5. Five, five. One of the best FM games I've seen in a long, long time. Um, I'm going to say unlucky to the boys. not going to mention too much to them. But that was actually really entertaining and really good fun to watch. And that's why I think being in League One will be good next year. Wow, look at that. Incredible stuff. The main part of the tactic that's working well is, is creating chances and scoring goals. We're very, very good going forwards. And that's what's helping the tactic do well in this league. If we went up a, a level, 
would be much worse defensively. And I don't think it would be anyone who was good going forward, which I think would naturally hold us back. So we might have to change the tactic going into next year, but then like with the players, I don't even know what we'd go to, to be honest. But yeah, what what two games that was. I was really happy with that. I know we drew at home to one of the worst teams in the league, but 5-5, five, five, what a game of football. And um, yeah, there you go. Interesting. Okay, next episode then. So we're going to come back. We've already said, I think, at the end of the last episode, MK London Derby. And the reason is that that's when we do our next changeover of our individual training in our individual training plan. So that's what we'll come back for. And we'll obviously review everything that's gone on in the three months before. But right now, some of the training has been absolutely brilliant with some of the players, whether they've got like a role selected or not, which is just... It's just really, really good to see the players do so well. But again, I think the results are helping. Let's see what happens next season if we're in the championship and we're not winning. And we're doing pretty much the same thing. But we're going to have our season-long training plan for next season, aren't we? So there we are as well. But that's going to do it. Thank you for watching the episode. I hope you're enjoying the series still. A slightly different with us looking at the stats in this one. But I hope you're enjoying the series. And I'll see you all next time. <laughs>